Chapter 5. The Professional Mindset I questioned earlier what it means to be a professional, but even if being a professional isn't an explicit goal of yours, you should act as a professional. In fact, you should as quickly as possible jettison all feelings of being an amateur from your language and your very mind, no matter where you are on your creative journey. Be a professional. This means much more than making money or similar materialistic outcomes. This means treating yourself as if you are good enough to do the job you set out to do, and you are good enough to get paid to do it. It also means you respect those who are employing you enough to do the best job you can do with your resources and treat other professionals with the same due respect. From that position, it is very easy to determine what constitutes amateur behavior and avoid it. To go one step further, you should probably also avoid amateurs in general. Let's dig a bit deeper. Two mindsets. I like to contrast what I consider the professional mindset with what I call the amateur mindset. An amateur has a set of self-actualizing views about himself. Here are a few examples. One, I'm not good enough to earn money. Two, I'd like to be good one day. Three, I'm an aspiring writer. Four, I'd feel embarrassed to show this to people. Five, this guy is my idol. Six, I wish I could play like he does. Seven, I'm not sure what I'm best at. A professional has what amounts to the opposite view of themselves. Here are some examples. One, I deserve to get paid for my work. Two, I'm good at what I do. Three, I'm a writer. Four, it's hard limiting my portfolio to just a few good pieces. Five, I appreciate his art. I even learned a few things by analyzing it. Six, what a great piece. I think I'll learn it. Seven, I'm very good at these things. Perhaps I could be great at more things. Yes, professionals are always growing. It's not an arrival point, but a mindset or a way of doing things. Let's jam the amateur mindset. One of the first things I learned in the world of music is that amateurs and professionals have vastly different approaches to interacting with other musicians. This is all too common an experience. You run into some cool folks at a party or a show, and you get invited to come over and jam. A few days later, you pack your gear into your car, unload it at the new friend's house, and start warming up. You ask what everyone wants to play. Nobody knows. Everyone knows a few songs but no two people know the same song. You start goofing off and talking about what kinds of music everyone likes. The drummer likes Kiss. You like Sabbath. Not too far off. The bass player likes Korn. You cringe inwardly, but decide to teach everyone paranoid while you all have some beers. That gets boring, so you play a riff you came up with and the drummer plays along to it for a while. The other guitarist is lost on the chords, so he tries to solo on top of it using an E minor pentatonic scale the only one he learned from Guitar Player Magazine. You decide it was a good time. Maybe you guys should be a band. You call everyone the next week. Some people are busy, so you wait another week and meet up on Saturday two weeks later to jam some more. The bassist mentions his girlfriend is a good singer. Next time, she shows up. She doesn't know what to sing over your riff. You come up with some words that she doesn't like. You drink some more. That helps. The bassist comes up with another riff. It sounds like corn. After getting drunker, things start to sound okay. You spend the next week trying to herd the group together. The drummer is just not available. The other guitarist suggests a friend of his, but you all met at the first drummer's house, so maybe it's really his band. Worse, you left your amp over there. Amateurs jam. Professionals rehearse. In the music space, this says it all. When you first start out as a musician, especially in the rock genres, you will encounter lots of other musicians that are interested in jamming. This usually involves getting together and attempting to get music to emerge from an amorphous, unstructured interaction. In other words, it's unproductive. Let's be clear though, improvisation and conversational playing have an important place in the genres of jazz and blues. However, amateur musicians imagining starting up a rock or pop project seldom have a jazz background. In truth, jazz is highly structured. There's lots of improvisation, but usually over a standard set of chords and a melody that is decided upon by the group. Only the most extreme forms of jazz, such as free jazz, 
eschew this fundamental grounding to give way to the improvisational work. Jamming doesn't make you a free jazz player. Free jazz artists are generally well-versed in the more standard practice, which gives a huge language set for the interaction of the artists. I say this as a musician with huge amounts of improvisational experience, including free jazz performance. I should also note that free jazz is usually not very popular. What does this all mean? You'll find out through experience if you are a musician, but most amateurs don't have enough of an idea of what they are doing to jump into an improvisational setting and produce something worthwhile. When jazz musicians intend to record or perform, they rehearse. They get together, decide on what they are going to perform, often decided by a band leader, practice it together, and then get on with the recording or performance. This is the same for musicians in less improvisational genres as well. Amateurs invite their friends into the garage and hope they will become the next Beatles. Professionals assemble a band of like-minded artists to compose and perform music with specific goals and a musical direction in mind. More than that, they've probably composed their own music or decided on their repertoire before they ever start inviting others to fill out their group. So what should you do if you want to operate as a professional? You have to learn to say no a lot. If there is no goal, you should pass on jamming. If the goal is different from your own artistic goals, you should probably pass, but you may want to participate for career reasons. You'll have to be the judge. Approaching things as an amateur will usually cause you to waste your time. Acquiescing to amateurs will also suck your time away. So be a professional and work only with other professionals if you value your time and want to create artistic outputs with any sort of reasonable time investment. Working with others. The above lesson can be transcribed to a variety of other media. Are you a comic artist? Work with a professional writer, not an aspiring writer. The inverse is true for writers. Work with competent, professional artists, not wannabes. Are you a filmmaker? Work with legitimate cinematographers, actors, and production staff. Don't hire wannabes. Are you a wannabe? Stop it. When it comes to working with others, you should always have the end goals agreed upon by both of you. What is this project? Where is it heading? How do we know we have completed it? How long until we complete this project? What does the workflow for each of us look like? You should also be upfront about money. Is one person bearing the financial responsibility in hiring all others? This is common in the comics industry, where one person on the project, such as the writer, will act as the publisher and hire artists, colorists, letterers, editors, and anyone else, either for a set fee or else negotiate royalties with each of them separately. With music, how are royalties going to be handled? Who is managing the band, if anyone? How much are you going to charge for each performance, and what is the split? You will save yourself lots of drama by having all financial aspects out in the open before you begin committing to any collaborations. This doesn't mean you have to have every detail in some legalistic contract, but everyone should at least be on the same page as far as financial goals go. The less drama you have, or really, the more you avoid dramatic collaborations, the more you will spend your time on projects that will reach fruition rather than wither on the vine. You will be much more prolific approaching all partnerships like a professional. The Problem with Writing Groups Participation in writing groups is something a great many writers, myself included, will experience or have experienced in the past. These are either formal or informal gatherings of writers with the purpose of reading and giving feedback to the group members on their writing. This has the possibility of offering a cheap way to improve your writing, especially early on. You get feedback from several other people, and you also have deadlines to push you toward goal completion, and deadlines can be very helpful, as I will detail later. However, these sorts of pursuits are often counterproductive when you consider the alternatives. First, in a writing group, you are treating yourself as an amateur who is blind to his skill without external feedback and whose time is worthless. Second, you are dealing with a group of people who are likewise in the amateur mindset. It's the blind leading the blind, and very often each person is trying to blindly walk in a different direction, since it is rare to have a group of writers who all want to write in the same genre. When you think of spending your time in a writing group, consider alternatives. 1. Rather than spending time reading the work of amateurs, you should be reading the work of professionals to learn their effective techniques. 2. Rather than getting feedback from readers who aren't knowledgeable of your genre and who aren't experts in the craft, 
you could get feedback from an expert in both your genre and your craft, an established editor. Three, rather than spending your time meeting with other people who have different publication goals than you, you could be writing. Yes, it costs money to hire an editor, but if your time is valuable, and it is, that should be an acceptable trade-off if you feel you need that guidance and feedback to improve your manuscript. Remember, a professional values his or her time since time is money. Likewise, he will consider the time of other professionals to be of value as well. Like many things, there is an absolute value to being part of a critique group, but what is more important is the comparative value. Compared to doing something else, like I suggest, is it a benefit or a loss? Is the group of a high enough quality that you, along with all the others, are getting a solid benefit from participation? How to be a professional Nobody is perfect, and sometimes life gets in the way of productivity, but you should endeavor to meet all of these maxims. 1. Work for payment. That means no free work unless that free work is explicitly tied to something else that is providing value for you. A free book on Amazon should be building your email list, generating reviews for future monetization, or selling a future book in the series. If you are a musician, you should get paid for sitting in with the band. If you go to an open mic night, it should be to sell tickets to a concert or some other monetization. Free art distributed online should be building your commission business. One of your end goals should be earning a return on your time investment. 2. Deliver on time. If you have a time-bounded task or deadline, you should be meeting that deadline every single time that you aren't impaired by something truly significant. Don't miss deadlines because you have a cold. If you miss a deadline, it should be a near miss. There should never be a case where you can't deliver the product at all. Just a tip, if you can set a deadline, set it at least a week or two after you think you'll be done, just in case you get the flu. If you crowdfund your project, you have customers that deserve their item when you agreed to give it to them. Don't make them regret supporting you. 3. Treat others like they are professionals and expect others to act professionally toward you. Save the drama for your mama. Pay your collaborators on time and in full. Don't work with amateurs who suck up your time. Don't tolerate flakes. Don't work with people who miss deadlines and make you look bad by association. Do not tolerate parties who are inconsistent with payment. 4. Present yourself as a professional to the customers and audience. Look the part. Talk the part. Don't show up drunk or high to gigs. Don't act like an amateur who doesn't value the time of others. Have confidence in the tasks you know you can do and be upfront with your skills when collaborating with others. Avoid dramatic entanglements. 5. Use the appropriate tools. Invest in high-grade gear that can get the job done. This includes software. Don't use the free alternative just because it is free. If Photoshop is the industry standard, use it. Artists shouldn't be inking with big pens, but with quality India ink and good brushes. Musicians shouldn't be showing up with the amp that came with their first guitar. In fact, all guitarists reading this have my official permission to buy a high-quality tube amplifier. 6. Produce a great product. This is the most important thing of all. You should give every project your full confidence and effort, with the intention of making the best it possibly can be. It should stand side by side with the work of other professionals and have full value. If it doesn't stand up, then work hard to improve and get as close as you can to your ideal standard with each attempt. Why you should be a professional. Not act like a professional. Be a professional. You should adopt this mindset because it will enhance what you are doing. Others will perceive you differently. You will perceive yourself differently. Adopting this attitude will be a constant reminder to yourself that you are very serious about what you are doing that you are endeavoring to succeed, and that you are worthy of success. You are what you repeatedly do, so being professional will turn you into a professional. You can try the following experiment if you doubt me. Put on a suit or professional dress every time you intend to work, whether it is going to a practice room, sitting down to draw or paint, sitting down to write, etc. Do it consistently for at least a week. I've done this in several environments, and it works. First, when you go into a practice room, or wherever, 
You are wearing a reminder that you are there to work, not goof off. Looking at your hands and seeing cuffs there will make it crystal clear what you should be doing if your focus begins to wane. Second, other people will magically treat you better. They will treat you like a professional because you look like a professional. That in turn will feed back into your self-image and make you live up to those people's perceptions of you. If you look out of place, don't let it bother you. You're just trying this for a week after all, and if it doesn't work, dressing well won't do you any career harms. Moreover, I discovered that, at least as a man, it's very difficult to be overdressed. When you dress well and everyone else doesn't, you merely make everyone else look like slobs. I did this at a few different jobs I had teaching guitar lessons at music stores. People who didn't know me assumed that I was the manager or owner. When people came in seeking lessons, they assumed I was the best teacher there because I looked like the best one there. That drove up my business, which gave me more experience in a shorter amount of time, thus making me the best teacher there as a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. There is, of course, more to success in professional attitude than smart dress, like always showing up on time. But I know my wardrobe had an impact. The best part? I got all my first suits for less than $100 total at thrift stores. Men usually get rid of clothes not because they have gone out of style, but because they have grown sideways out of them, which means it's easy to get good suits, often worn very little, for a cheap price. This is not something I do now, but it was a great thing to do at the time. If you feel your wardrobe is light on the professional attire, and you are a man, it's harder for women. Head over to the Goodwill on the nice side of town and see what's there for you. The Social Media Professional As an artist in the 21st century, you cannot ignore social media. It is where your audience is. Gone are the days when audience interaction meant walking on stage or showing up to a convention to shake hands and sell books. Now it is all about the two-way information flow. Just like managing your time on social media, managing the way you act on social media is a balancing act. Before I go further, let me say that the wisdom that you have heard regarding how a professional ought to act on social media is likely the inverse of reality. If you think a professional ought to be polite and neutral, not negative, and certainly never crass or insulting on social media, you are dead wrong. Let me explain. When you are trying to build an audience, and most importantly, sell a product, you have to gain the attention of people. There are a few ways to do this, but they ultimately boil down to two paths. One, you create interesting content that people pay attention to. Two, you rent the audience from people who make interesting content that people pay attention to. The first path is the more difficult of the two, but is ultimately the most effective over the long term, because it not only builds the audience, it creates a means by which you continue to hold their attention. The second path is advertising. It is expensive and temporary, lasting only as long as you are willing to continue paying for it. If you want to be polite, neutral, and generally likable, you are going to have to go the second route because you will be too boring for anyone to care about. Pay attention to headlines. What does every news organization do in their headlines? They sell controversy. They appeal to prejudice. They appeal to anger, outrage, cynicism, and identity. This is how they gain attention. It is very difficult to gain attention by being positive or wholesome. This is the reality of human nature. We respond to negative emotions with more vigor than positive ones. This means that the content you produce, especially if it is in the realm of ideas, such as blog posts or discussion videos, will have a much better chance of grabbing attention if it is negative in some way. The popular channels that you end up having to rent are run by the people who understand this. If I do a negative movie review, it will get three to five times the views on average of a positive one, particularly if the video title points to the opinion, like when I say in a title that a movie sucks. It's so lopsided that some viewers complain that I just hate everything, when in fact most of my reviews are positive. They just aren't watching, or aren't being shown by YouTube, any of the positive ones. However, doing nothing but negative, controversial content will not maintain an audience for an artist. For that, you need content that makes your audience feel good and makes them like you. Also in my experience, people you attract via negativity are in a negative place generally, or else will feel negative emotions associated with you, even if they agree with you. They aren't likely to be the positive fans that will approach your art with an expectation that they will like it. 
I have followed a strategy that mixes the potent negative content with the less potent positive content for quite a while. The growth is slower, but the audience that sticks around is generally more interested in you than people you pick up purely through negative content. I put out a few controversial videos per week, talking about things like bad modern movies, politics, problems in the publishing world, social justice, and the actions of big corporations like Disney. The rest of the week I spend doing things like putting out audiobook chapters or short readings, analyzing Pulp Fiction, talking logic, talking about heavy metal, and giving writing lectures. As a concrete example, here are the videos I put out January 19th through 25th, 2020. Sunday, trans sci-fi author cancelled by trans mob over pro-trans story. Monday, all it takes is one complaint to lose your email database. Tuesday, review, an encyclopedia of Tolkien by David Day. Wednesday, live stream, new pub talk, Conan vs. Elric with Jesse White. Thursday, MTG review, magic game night box set. Friday, storycraft, 10 ways to make a character likable. Saturday, hot girls for Bernie, postmodern beauty in politics. It was a bit of a wild week, so I did three controversial videos. The rest were positive videos that were also highly targeted towards fantasy fans. People like me and people who are likely to enjoy my fantasy books. These videos aren't just a way to market. They are a way to develop relationships with viewers, to have the discussions I enjoy having on the internet with people who like similar things to me. Information flows two ways. It's very different from an ad. The unkind internet. There is a downside to putting out controversial content, and it is the fact that you will attract people who hate you as much as you attract people who think the way you do. Just to clarify, controversial is context-specific. Putting out a video about how much a Star Wars movie sucks is very controversial to one demographic, but is irrelevant to others. Controversial can mean political, but not necessarily. How you deal with haters, trolls, and malcontents is up to you. You can try to convince them, virtually never works. You can engage them in hopes of convincing bystanders, sometimes works. Or you can block, always works. I have different strategies depending on the platform. A good strategy for Twitter, or similar, is to block any random haters or idiots that have a small follower count. It's a waste of your time to engage anonymous trolls and sock puppets. If the account has a large following, consider if engaging them will attract their audience. If not, again, you should block them. Don't ignore, block, or ban. It took me far too long to learn this, and there are hours, perhaps days, I will never get back because I didn't realize it was pointless to talk to morons and people who wish I was dead. I take an approach to YouTube that is similar to Twitter, but I tend to ignore a lot more of the noise and let people go at it in the comments section, mostly because there is more to deal with than on other platforms. But I won't hesitate to ban if somebody is being dishonest or annoying to everyone else. If somebody is drifting by your videos to hurl insults at you and everyone else, there is really no downside to banning them. They don't improve your SEO, search engine optimization, with insults, and they aren't going to buy anything from you. This approach has significantly improved my experience and made my comment section much more fun to participate in. If you are a person who loves conflict, feel free to ignore my advice, but as a person who generally is tolerant of conflict, I tend to avoid most of it because it is simply a waste of my time. Some followers are attracted to people who like to dish it out, though, so know thyself and use your best judgment. I don't believe in being apolitical because nobody is actually apolitical, and I don't believe that being professional on social media involves shutting up and letting hundreds of people dogpile you. What you should reject is the notion that blocking someone is bad. People who complain about being blocked by people they dislike are complaining about a core feature of the platform. It's there to filter out the noise from the interactions which really matter to the users, and you should use it as a creator. Likewise, trolls will disrupt conversations that you want to have with others, what I call bell ringing, so blocking is always better than muting or trying to just ignore the person. Being professional on social media does not necessarily mean being polite. It does mean managing your profiles with your business in mind. That means focusing on your audience, not on trolls. It does not mean you have to grin through harassment and abuse.